So I really hope there's no echo that's going to be there on this particular audio because I'm in a different recording space and I just wanted to do you guys a quick video on caustic ingestion. Pretty much those people that come in having swallowed acids, having swallowed alkali, grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazebu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at caustic ingestion, pretty much acids and alkali. Remember that these are going to be found in our homes. They're going to be used as solids or liquid drains. It could be toilet bowl cleaners. There are different chemicals in the house that have acids, different chemicals that have alkalis, and these vary in concentration. And generally, the ones that you're going to be using for domestic purposes are going to be much less concentrated than the industrial ones. So if someone gets an industrial product and they decide to swallow it, it's going to cause a lot of disaster. Most of the ingestion, 80% of it worldwide, is going to be occurring in children because they don't really know that this is not supposed to be eaten, this is not food, they think everything is food. So it's going to be accidental ingestion and when they realize it's bitter, they spit it out or they leave it alone. So it's often just small amounts and it's benign. But in adults, on the other hand, it will be in the background of someone who tries to commit suicide. So often they ingest large amounts of it and it's quite detrimental. So what exactly happens in ingestion of these caustic substances? Remember that if it's a solid thing, it can easily stick to your mucous membranes. It can leave small particles there. So those small particles that are going to be sticking to your mucous membranes or sticking to the tissues can begin to burn the tissues and are going to be causing further damage. So we're going to see that there's a much more localized type of injury that we see with this. On the other hand, with the liquids, because they're not sticking to anywhere and someone can ingest large amounts of it, then generally these ones are easily ingested in large amounts so they're going to be cause widespread damage. And moreover, some of these liquids can be aspirated into the upper airway. Remember that you have two main types of things here. You have acids and you have alkalis. And there's a type of necrosis that happens with acids, which is known as coagulative necrosis, where the, the proteins are denatured. And there's a type of uh, necrosis that happens with alkali liquefaction, where the tissues are made into liquid form. They're made into mush. And remember that with the alkalis, they tend to be much, much deeper than the acids. So in terms of the coagulation necrosis that happens with the acids, it's going to result in escar formation, which may limit the further damage. So remember that your acids are going to be affecting the stomach more than the esophagus. While this on the alkalis, on the other hand, they're going to be causing this liquefactive necrosis. There's no escar that is forming greater risk of these acids even digging deeper into the tissues unless if they're neutralized or they are diluted. And these may actually cause significant amounts of damage and they're going to be affecting the esophagus more than the stomach. But if a person decides to swallow quite a large amount of them, they can affect both the esophagus and the stomach. So what happens when they swallow these things? They're going to have features of caustic ingestion. They're going to have drooling. They're going to have dysphagia. In severe cases, they may have things like pain, vomiting. Sometimes they may have bleeding from the mouth, from the throat, from the chest, even in the abdomen. The airway can be compromised. It can lead to airway burns. So they may need some intubation in some cases. So they may be coughing, tachypnea, they may be strider. Generally, in the mouth, you may sometimes see this swelling, swollen tissue that is red in the mouth, but generally the mouth can sometimes look normal. It does not mean that if the mouth looks normal, it doesn't mean that the esophagus is okay. It doesn't mean that the stomach is okay. So do not just assume. So generally, there may be some even further serious injury downstream in the GIT. So it may further complicate into certain things. The esophagus can perforate. So if the esophagus perforates, it spills all its contents into the mediastinum, leading to a mediastinitis. This can cause severe chest pain, tachycardia, fevers, tachypnea, and the patient can even be in shock. This complication can occur within hours. It can occur after weeks. It can even occur in between these times, hours to weeks. You may also have a perforation in terms of the stomach. You may have a gastric perforation leading to peritonitis that may need surgery. These perforations do need surgery. They need antibiotics and they need surgery. So this can occur also within hours and even after weeks or anything in between. Later on, most of these, if not all of them, are going to develop strictures and they tend to be quite bad. It, you, it can be in the background of someone who has actually swallowed a mild amount or a small amount of this, and you may even have treated them adequately. Then a few weeks after, they come back with a stricture. 
So remember that these strictures may cause shortening of the esophagus, they may cause narrowing of the esophagus, they may lead to dysphagia, they may lead to motility disorders. And later on in life, there is a risk of increased uh, incidence of esophageal carcinoma in these patients. In terms of investigations, generally you don't want to rush and shunt your patients to go for investigations quickly. You first want to stabilize your patient. You should not rush to go and get an endoscopy for the patient, stabilize them first because they may die before they actually even do the procedure. So the endoscopy can actually be done to check for the severity of the uh, esophageal and the gastric burns. But remember, you shouldn't make the decision on the mouth or what you see in the mouth to indicate whether the person needs an endoscopy or not, because the mouth can be okay and they may have worse things in the esophagus and in the stomach. Chest x-ray is of limited use because it's not so sensitive in terms of esophageal perforation, so you're better off doing a CT scan of the chest, a CT of the abdomen, if you're suspecting that there is a perforation. In terms of management, it's a bit similar, whether it's an acid or it's an alkali, it's pretty much going to be supportive care. We do not want to empty the stomach, you don't want to make the patient vomit, big mistake. You don't want to perform a gastric lavage because once you do this, you're re-exposing the upper uh, GIT to those caustic agents again. You do not want to attempt to neutralize these because whether someone has swallowed an acid, then you think, okay, let me give them an alkali to neutralize it. Or if someone has swallowed an alkali, let me give them an acid. Do not attempt to do this because remember when an acid and an alkali react, there are two types of reactions that happen generally in chemistry. You have those that produce energy, those are known as exothermic reactions. And you have those that take in energy, we, know, and we call them as an endothermic reaction. So these are going to be causing severe exothermic reactions that can cause even more damage. Do not attempt to give them activated charcoal because it may be infiltrating the, the burnt tissue. It may also interfere with the evaluation when you do endoscopy. Do not attempt to insert an NGT because you may cause further damage to the mucosa. You may even instigate a perforation when you are pushing in your NGT. So I know there's something about milk that people trust so much in poisoning, but in poisoning itself, in other different types of poisoning, milk really has no role. In this case, we're not giving it to neutralize the acid or the alkali, we're just giving it to dilute. So you can either give them milk or you can give them water. That's just in the first few minutes that they have ingested this caustic liquid. But sometimes if it's a solid, you may give it, if even after they've taken it after a while, you may still give them some milk or some water. It's just for dilution. It does not neutralize anything. So generally we should avoid a dilution if the patient is nauseated, if they're drooling, if there's any strider or any abdominal distension. Attempt to keep your patients nil per oral and give them supplemental IV fluids in the first 24 to 48 hours. If they're in shock, manage that. You may consider putting them on a proton pump inhibitor like an intravenous isomeprazole. And if they have a gastric perforation or an esophageal perforation, you want to cover them on antibiotics, take them for surgery. We do not routinely recommend that you give IV corticosteroids to taper down the inflammatory system. We do not advise for that. We do not advise any routine prophylactic antibiotic use. If they develop a stricture later on, they have to come back where they can undergo uh, bougienage. That's one word that you don't hear every day or if it's actually severe or they're unresponsive to the initial treatment, then you can do an esophageal bypass. So they get part of the colon and then they bypass the obstruction or where the stricture is using tissues of the colon. And you often need surgery for this. Or they can actually go endoscopy and dilate those strictures, but most of the times they'll keep coming in for these procedures because they'll have quite nasty strictures. I really hope you enjoyed this video on caustic ingestion. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon so you never miss on such amazing content every time I post. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.